Well, here at Shoreline Church, uh, we talk about seven markers of spiritual maturity. They're really just, just biblical guidelines for what it means to be growing in faith. We got thinking about this because I kind of we were pondering the idea. If you ask most Christians, are you growing up in faith? Most Christians will say, well, am I growing in faith? Am I, am I growing more mature in faith? I, I guess I go to church, you know, occasionally and I read my Bible. So I, I, I guess so. How do we know we're growing in faith? Well, we, we've identified these seven markers after a year of time with our children, youth and adult leaders studying the scriptures. We said there's really seven areas that distinctly mark the life of a growing Christian. And one of those areas is humble service where we're humbly serving other people like Jesus did. And I think that's wonderful about humble service is it's one of those things that's kind of for everybody. There's some things in life that are just for certain people. Some, some abilities some people have that are unique to them. Some callings people have from Jesus that are unique to them. Uh, I think about this when I was in junior high and high school. Every so often you'd be with friends and you'd end up having one of these funny conversations with a, can you do this? You know, can you do this? Can you do that? And a lot of those had to do with actually the tongue. Some of you might, even when I'm explaining this, you might go, I remember doing that as a kid. I remember times where we'd be talking with friends and somebody would say, hey, can you do this? And trill your tongue. Really cool if you're in junior high or high school. Can you, can you go? I remember my mom, when we would do this in our family, we'd kind of talk. My mom would go, I can do that. She'd go. We'd go, mom, that's not. It's like she couldn't do it. Her tongue just didn't work that way. And if you start going down that can you trail, some people say, well, can you do this? Can you make your tongue, your tongue round like this, like a tube? Can you go, and some people can't do it. And, and, then, and then some people, the, the really talented people will say, can you do this? And they'll take their tongue and they'll turn it over. I can't do that. That's just for certain people. And then when you get in that conversation, people start to say things like, well, you know what I can do? I can do this. And like, they'll take their arm and pull it over their head behind them. Ah! And you're kind of creepy. They go, I'm double jointed. And you find out all kinds of interesting things about people. Can you do this? There's some things that some people can do and other people can't. And and even spiritually, that's true. There's some giftings and some callings that are just for certain people. Some people have the gift of teaching. Other people don't. That's okay. You don't need everyone to be a teacher in the church. Some people have gifts of discernment, where they kind of know when evil's present or, or when something's not quite right, and they can discern it by the Holy Spirit. That's unique to some people. Everyone doesn't need to have that ability. Some people love and get called to go on mission trips. But I don't believe that every single Christian needs to go on a mission trip. Some, there's certain people that that's kind of part of their calling. Some people are called to volunteer with junior high kids. That's a unique calling with a certain kind of heart and certain kind of personality. There's certain things that are, that are for certain people. But then there's some things that are for all of us. There's some things in the Christian faith and our journey of faith that's for everyone. Grace, showing grace to other people. That's for everybody. We're all called to be grace givers and grace sharers. Being part of fellowship, gathering together as God's people like we're doing right now online and like we're going to be doing next weekend on our campus and online. You know, some people you know, say, well, that's not, that's not for me. No, that's for everybody. Jesus says, I want everyone to be in the fellowship of the body of Christ. We're all called to show compassion, to show the heart of Jesus. There's some things that are for everybody, but I want to take it up a step. There's some things that aren't just for some, that aren't just for everybody, but they're for everybody. And Jesus said, let me make it clear from the mouth of Jesus, this is for everyone. And one of those things that Jesus was so clear about is humble service. As a matter of fact, Jesus was so clear that he actually did something that was so shocking and so out of place in his culture, in his day, where he humbly served in a way that the humblest of servants would do. That that, that was their job. And kind of normal people wouldn't do this. And it was actually washing feet. In the ancient world, and in John chapter 13, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 13. In the ancient world, that was a practice that was reserved for a household servant. And sometimes you would come into a home, there'd be a servant there, and and you'd have been wearing sandals, you're on dusty, dirty trails. And when you'd come in, there would be be a, a bowl or basin of water and a towel. And you could kind of wash your own feet to kind of be polite to the people who had the house. But if there was someone there that could do it, they would oftentimes wash your feet. Well, what we're going to look at today is is a biblical passage that really gives us a picture of God's call to all of us. Uh, Humbly serving is for every one of us. So look with me at John chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. And one of the things I want to remind you of, and I say this off and on again, it's just a great concept, that every text, every text of the Bible has a context. So John 13 sits within a text of the Bible, but it sits within a historical context. And so as I begin reading John 13, beginning in verse 1, 
I want you just to kind of notice the context. There's a lot going on here. If you're a note taker, if you're a real student of the word, you're going to have something start to jump out at you right away. But listen to God's word. John chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I love those words. He loved us to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. That's a lot of context. There's a lot going on there. So before Jesus gets up to wash their feet, John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, gives us the setting, the environment. And the first thing in that setting was, it was the Passover festival. The Passover festival was when the lamb was slain. When the blood of that lamb reminded them of when the people of Israel were set free from bondage in Egypt, and they sacrificed a lamb, had a meal of lamb. It wasn't wasted, they had a meal of lamb, but they put the blood on the doorpost. And because of that, the angel of death that came throughout Egypt passed over over their homes, and there was no death and no judgment. They were remembering that, but, but the lamb was still being slain as part of that memorial. So Jesus is going to wash the feet of the disciple, all of the disciples, and then he was going to go to the cross and die for the disciples and for everyone who would follow him, who would become his disciple, for you and for me, if we put our faith in Jesus. The ultimate final act of humble service was Jesus dying on the cross. So at that, at that Passover meal, where, there, where the lamb has been slain, a picture of Jesus who's going to die on the cross, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Jesus, got up from the table and washed their feet. That's the context, Passover. That's a big deal. We have to get some of that background and history there. Also, Jesus knew where he was going. It's very clear. He understands he's going back to the Father. He has the security of that, the hope of that. And out of that, he washes feet. We read in this passage that Jesus knew that he had fulfilled his mission. He had done what he had come to do. He fulfilled it. He had loved those those people to the very end. He knew he had fulfilled his mission that the Father had sent him on. We know that the meal had already started. So there's around the table, the meal had started. And what what we discover as you go through the passage is that as the people had come into that room, there was a basin and there was a pitcher with water and there was a towel sitting by the door. It was there, but there was no servant there to wash anyone's feet. And one by one, the disciples came in and walked past that bowl and past that pitcher and past that towel and sat at the table with dirty feet. One by one by one. None of them offered, and after walking with Jesus for three years, none of them said, hey, maybe I'll wash someone else's feet. I'll model what Jesus has been teaching us for all these years about humility. None of them thought to do that. So so Jesus then eventually leaves the table and does what none of them were willing to do. So they're in this meal. They're around the table. Their feet are still dirty. We also see in this passage that Jesus knew his power and his destination. He knew he had come from the Father. He knew who he was, and he knew he was returning to heaven. It's interesting, those first three verses, and I encourage you to go back and, and study those and really reflect on those. It's setting the scene. Jesus knew where he came from. He knew who he was. He, he knew what was going on. He, he even knew that Judas was going to betray him. Knowing all of that, Jesus did something. We pick that up in verses 4 through 5. We learn that God bows down to wash feet. And when you read John 13, 4 to 5, you need to picture in your mind Jesus washing, washing their feet. Because it, it, you can't wash feet standing up. Unless Jesus is saying to them, okay, Lift your foot up here and grabs their leg up here and washes their foot. You don't do that. When you wash feet, you kneel down because where are our feet? They're on the ground. They're down low. The picture is this. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, who had come from the Father, who was returning to the Father. Jesus, who's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That Jesus literally gets on his knees at the feet, the dirty feet of sinful, broken people and washes their feet. It's a powerful picture. Follow along with me in John 13, beginning in verse 4. So he, Jesus, got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. That would have been the the garb, that would have been the dress of a servant. So he took not only the action of a servant, but he looked like a servant. He wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet 
drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. God took the humble role of a servant. Jesus came humbly and left heaven to be born. He lived in this, in this world and served and loved and cared, never sinning, living perfectly. Now he's washing feet, and in a short time, he'll be hanging on a cross. This is our Savior. This is our Jesus, a humble, loving, caring Savior. And he didn't cut corners. It's, it's clear that Jesus did it just like a servant in those days would do. He, he, he kind of changed his clothing to look like a servant. He took the actions of a servant. Why? Because in his heart of hearts, he came as a servant. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, we actually read that, that Jesus Christ is talking to himself and he says this, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' mission statement is, I've not come to be served, I've come to serve. That's the heart of our Savior. And if we're disciples who follow Jesus, guess what? Our heart's supposed to be like his heart, our actions are supposed to be like his actions, which means we get involved in humble service. That's part of God's call. Now, as Jesus is going around the table from person to person washing feet, you can, almost, you can almost picture it. There's this drama unfolding. He comes to one of the disciples, Jesus, the first one. He kneels at their feet, begins washing their feet and drying them. You've got to believe that the, the room is silent and they're just watching. What's Jesus doing? We know he's the Lord of glory. We know who he is. This doesn't make sense. He goes to the next person, washes their feet, dries them. But when he gets to Peter, it kind of unfolds because Peter was the one who when Jesus, you know, Jesus was walking in the water, says, let me jump out and walk with you, Jesus. Peter's the one who in the garden would, would pull out the sword and fight back. And Peter was a man of action. So, so Peter, and Peter always has something to say. So let's look at how, how Jesus interacts with Jesus. I call this an interesting encounter and conversation. This is in John 13, 6 through 11. So Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Well, then Lord Simon Peter replied, that not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. He gets a little enthusiastic. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew that he, who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not every one of you is clean. So Jesus is going around the table. He gets to Peter, and there's this unique interaction. You know, Peter basically says, this isn't going to happen. I can't let you wash my feet. Now, you have to remember that when Jesus earlier had said, who do people say that I am? And they were saying, well, some people say you're one of the prophets. And some, and some say you're Elijah, risen from the dead. And, and you know, they, they, they said, all these things are being said about Jesus. Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? It was Peter who inspired by the Holy Spirit said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I mean, that was Peter. He got it. He knew who Jesus was. Peter was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration where God Almighty said, this is my son. He heard that, the heavenly voice, God the Father saying, this is my son. Peter knew who Jesus was. And it just didn't make sense for God in human flesh to wash his feet. I would hope that if I knew what Peter knew, I would have said the same thing. Jesus, this doesn't make any sense. And Jesus says, it doesn't have to make sense. But you do need to let me do it. Because I love you that much and I know what you need. It also doesn't make sense that he would die on a cross for our sins. But let's not refuse that either. Let's receive the humble service of our Lord and let's hear his call to live like him. And so as we look at this passage, and I want to let you know that next week, we're going to finish this passage. We're going to actually spend two weeks. This is, this is such an important biblical text. And oftentimes we will refer to it quickly, but we're slowing down and spending two weeks on this story because it paints this picture of what our lives are supposed to look like. But what I want to do is I want to just to kind of glean some simple lessons from a vision of God's humble service. If you can picture in your mind Jesus washing their feet, if you can even picture yourself, if had you been at that table, he would have washed your feet too. If you can see Jesus in this place of humility, it creates a vision, a picture that should drive our lives forward and shape who we are and how we live. And so I want to just kind of draw six simple lessons that can speak to our hearts. 
If you're a note taker, you'll notice in your, in, in your Shoreline app uh, that there's a place to kind of fill in some blanks and, and respond to some of these things. So here's lesson number one. True, humble service is extended with clear awareness of the cost. If you're going to serve humbly, you're going to know something. This is going to cost me. Service always costs something. You know, our, our worship teams, this morning we got to see different worship teams throughout the year. You know, they, they get to church two hours or, or more before the first service. Our production volunteers who put these kind of services together for us for those that are online. They get, they get there hours before the service even begins. It costs them to serve Jesus. Now here's the beauty. It's always worth it. It really is. But it costs something. And Jesus knew it would cost something. What does it cost us when we serve Jesus humbly? What does it cost us when we follow his example and serve the world and serve the church? Well, it costs us time. There's just a raw reality that it costs time to serve. I think of our precept upon precept class that's coming up. And Barb Pena. You know, Roy is one of our pastors, her husband, but she's a volunteer. She's been volunteering doing precept upon precept for years. I would venture a guess that it's not hundreds of hours, but thousands of hours of preparation over the years to teach people at Shoreline Church the Word of God. But it's worth it. Every time somebody says, I get it, I'm understanding God's word, I'm reading it in a fresh new way, I'm learning context and history and background, it's coming alive. Someone like Barb just says, you know what? Yeah, it costs a lot of time, but it's worth it because God is using me as his servant. But it costs us time. It costs money. I'm preaching right now in this beautiful courtyard. And many of you serve Jesus by giving sacrificially so we can have this space. Just in time for COVID. God knows his timing, right? And, and yet, man, people gave. And, and here's the thing about when you give. When you give, you have that much less. And some people, so I, I've heard a radio and TV preachers say, you know, if you give $10, you're going to get 100 back. If you give 100 you're going to get 1000 back. Sometimes when you give, you get more money. I believe when you give, you always get a blessing of some sort. But sometimes when you give $100, what you have is $100 less in your account. Sometimes when you give $1,000, what you have is $1,000 less in your account. A blessing in your heart, other blessings. But it costs something. But that's okay. It's always worth it. Sometimes it even costs your reputation and the way people see you. Humbly serving. So here Jesus is, God in human flesh. He's kneeling down at the feet of the disciples. I mean, we're supposed to kneel down before God. But he kneels at their feet to wash their feet. There's a humility that even lays down the potential of people misunderstanding and can affect your reputation. I remember the first time I walked into the world headquarters of Zondervan Publishing. They'd opened this brand new uh, publishing uh, house, this massive facility in Grand Rapids, Michigan. There was a guy coming to my church in Michigan who worked there. He said, hey, we're having a grand opening. You want to come and take a tour? So I went and I took a tour of the building. It was real interesting. They were answering questions. And as I was taking the tour, I said to somebody, you know, and this was years ago, I said, you know, my wife has got a degree in theology and a degree in education, and she's raising our little kids. But man, I think she could do some freelance work. She loves to read, and she's always evaluating books and they said, well, when we're done, I'll point you out to someone you can have her talk to. I said, great, finish the tour. And we finished the tour. And there was a guy over, the, the guy at the punch bowl, there's a guy pouring punch to all the guests that are coming. And they said, you should go talk with that guy. And, and they said, tell that guy what you told me. So I go over to the punch bowl guy. And I get a cup of punch. And I said, hey, listen, I was talking to the person giving the tour. And I said, this is the background of my wife. And she might be interested. And he says, well, tell me about your wife. And I said, well, she went to Calvin College. He goes, oh, interesting. He pulls out his little notepad. He's a graduate of Calvin College. He writes down some information. Well, what else? I said, well, she went to Fuller Seminary, has a degree in, in, in uh, evangel and, uh, discipleship and, uh, and spiritual formation and a degree in theology. And he said, oh, interesting. So then he kind of gives you some information. She should call this person and talk to them. So my friend that invited me, I said, I said to him when I went back by his office, I said, I, said, I talked to the, the punch guy. He gave me this information. He said, well, who's the punch guy? I said, Bruce, his name is Bruce Ricecamp. And he says, he's the president and CEO of Zondervan. He was the president and CEO of the largest Christian publisher in the world at that time. And he's pouring punch. Boy, that's a reputation check, isn't it? I mean, you, the person in charge, bring me some punch. Bring me, you know, bring, no, no. He's there pouring out punch for other people. Humble service. But it always costs something. When you lead a small group and prepare, it costs something. When you serve your spouse in your home, it costs something. When somebody serves at our food pantry, and we have lots of volunteers that do that, it costs them something. If you're a parent 
and you serve your children, it costs you. If anybody told a parent what it's gonna cost them through a whole lifetime, nobody would do it. You'll find out every single day, every single hour what it costs, but it's always worth it. When somebody becomes a youth volunteer in a church and pours in the lives of young people, it costs something, but it's worth it. If you go above and beyond in the workplace, right where you work, and you serve for the sake of Jesus to show his light and his love, it costs something, but it's always worth it. Here's lesson number two. Lessons from a vision of God's humble service. Number two, when we know who we are, we have the confidence we need to serve humbly. We've got to know who we are if we're going to serve humbly. Here's a question for you. Do I see myself the way Jesus sees me? Do you see yourself the way that Jesus sees you? Because if you do, you'll be more prone to serve. If you can say, listen, I want to see myself how Jesus sees me. Who am I? I'm saved by his grace. I'm a child of the living God. I'm God's representative and ambassador in this world. I'm radically forgiven. I've been shockingly served by Jesus Christ himself who gave his life on the cross for me. That's who I am, a child of God, an ambassador, but I'm also a humble servant. Jesus knew who he was and where he came from, so he served. You need to know who you are. We serve out of a position of knowing we are loved by God, valued by God, gifted by God. It's not feeling like we're nothing that causes us to serve. It's understanding that who we are. You know, Bruce Rice Camp could pour out punch for people because he knew he was the president and CEO. Jesus could wash feet because he knew he had come from the Father, was going to the Father, and he was God in human flesh. And you and I can serve because we know we are loved children of God, forgiven, saved, and valued in his sight. So let's get on our knees and serve people. Let's be like Jesus and wash feet in the ways that foot washing looks like in our world today. Another lesson from this vision of God's humble service. Number three, We need to notice the God-given opportunities. We should notice and pay attention, where are the opportunities to serve? Because there's lots of them. And sometimes they sneak up on us and all of a sudden we're just kind of going through our day and it's like, boom, there's an opportunity. Now let me be very clear about something. Every single need you encounter doesn't demand that you meet that need. You don't have to do every, people that try to meet every need they encounter basically drop over exhausted and dead. I mean, I I watch people in the church that think, I've got to do everything. No, you don't. But you do your part in what God calls you to do. And so I I want to encourage you to understand that that when you see a need, a God-given need, be open to it. So here's the question. How can I look for divine appointments and service opportunities? How can I look for and pay attention to and notice divine appointments? That's when God's opened a door. Service opportunities where God says, here's a chance. So here's a few ideas just to kind of help you tune in your heart and your mind to those opportunities around you. When you encounter somebody who's hurting, when someone is hurting, when someone is broken, when someone is lonely, that just might be an opportunity to serve. It just might be a moment that God is giving you, that God's opening up the door and kind of crossed your paths with that person, that circumstance. Now, I'm not saying you have to meet every need again, but I'm saying, would you stop and say, Lord, I've just seen and experienced a need. Could, you know, could you be, might you be leading me to meet this need? Might you be calling me to engage in some act of humble service? When you see a need in the church, it might be that God is, is kind of getting your attention, helping you see that because he wants you to meet that need. Again, you can't meet every need in the church. You can't serve in every ministry. But when you notice one, say, boy, there's really a need there, isn't there? Maybe it's the Holy Spirit prompting your heart. So at least pause. Say, Lord, could that be for me? Do you want me to step into and engage in that? I'm sure we have people in our church who have incredible musical gifts and vocal gifts that have never even let us know. People that are new at Shoreland that say, man, I'd love to be part of the worship team. And and you kind of notice, and even this morning as you were watching the worship, all the different weeks of worship through the year and saying, man, maybe I could be part of that. That might be the Holy Spirit. And if that's the case, contact our our worship department and say, I want to know more about that. I want to investigate that. Maybe earlier in the message, I was mentioning our production team gets here really early in the morning and you're thinking to yourself, man, I've got some gifts in that area. I've got a lot of interest. I've just never stepped into it. Maybe this is the time in 2021 where you say, listen, I want to check that out. Ask the Lord, pray about it. If God prompts you, check it out. Teaching, children's ministry, youth ministry, all of our ministries are going to be relaunching. We're already doing more and more on our campus outdoors but we're hoping to be able to move to some sense of normalcy in the relatively new f- near future. We're praying for that. Will you pray with us? Will you say to the Lord, I'm open to wherever you might guide me. If there's a need, you notice it in your church and the Lord stirs your heart, investigate it, look into it. 
and, and we are going to move back to some normal kinds of ministry. We're going to need hundreds and hundreds of people who've been kind of on the sideline for a while with COVID, and we understand that, we get it. But as we begin to relaunch, we need you to re-engage. Will you open your heart that as soon as you're ready to kind of be out in public and engaging with people, part of that would be stepping into the exciting engagement of the life of the church and using your gifting here. And then a fourth lesson from this vision of Jesus, this vision of humble service of Jesus washing feet. We don't serve only the deserving and the obvious. We don't just serve those who we think deserve it, who we kind of like, and it's obvious. We pay attention we follow the Holy Spirit, and we serve people who don't deserve the service we offer. Here's a question. Who am I slow to serve, and who do I avoid? Are there certain kinds of people that you just kind of are slow to help out, and you kind of avoid, and maybe God would stir your heart this year to engage in a new kind of service? As I think about Jesus uh, going around that table and washing the feet of the disciples, none of them deserved it. None of us deserve Jesus going to the cross. But none of the disciples were perfect. But when Jesus got to Peter... He knew Peter was going to deny him. He washed his feet. When Jesus got to Thomas, he knew Thomas was going to doubt him and doubt his resurrection. He washed his feet. And when Jesus got to Judas, we read in the passage, Jesus knew that Judas has already decided in his heart to betray him. We, there's nothing in the text that shows that Jesus uh, walked around Judas and ignored him. He washed his feet too. And later on, Judas left and betrayed him. We don't serve people because they deserve it. And Jesus didn't serve us because we deserve it. We serve because we're seeking to live like Jesus and he serves people who he knows don't deserve what he offered and we can do the same in his name. Lesson number five. Humble service is an all-in investment and we don't cut corners. When Jesus washed the feet of the disciples... He dressed like a servant. He did the actions of a servant. He followed all the way through to washing their feet and he dried them. He did, I think about sometimes I'll do dishes. I'll kind of do dishes and kind of put them out on the counter and let them drip dry. And Sherry's always like, well, can you take a towel and finish the job? You know, we can get halfway through the job. Jesus didn't kind of wash their feet and say, okay, drip dry. He took the towel. He dried their feet. He went all the way. As you take steps into humble service, be all in. Throw yourself into it. Say, Jesus, let me serve the way you have served me and let that be your model. And then number six, a final lesson from this vision of God's humble service. We serve the world because Jesus, God in human flesh, served us. We serve because we have been served. And oh, has Jesus served you and me. Had we been at, the, at that table, he would have washed our feet. Why can I say that to you? because he died on the cross for you and for me. The final ultimate act of humble service for Jesus was to take the cross, to bear our shame, to take our sins, to die in our place, to nail all that to the cross in his flesh, to pour out his blood and to die for us. That's our model. That's our example. So when Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, take up your, deny yourself, take up your cross every day and walk with me, follow me, He's talking about something serious and significant. Humble service is the call on every single follower of Jesus Christ. Some people can, some people can take their tongue and go, and like my mom can only go, some people, you know, there's some things that only certain people can do. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you have been loved by the Savior. He has given his life for you. He's borne your shame. He's paid the price. And what we're going to learn next week is he says, if I, your Lord and teacher, have served you, you also should serve others. We'll dig into that next week. For this week, let's look for opportunities to be more like Jesus through humble service. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your example. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your humble service. From washing feet to dying on a cross. Will you teach us what it means to walk in service that honors you and that blesses others? We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, this ends our, our second week uh, of worshiping online only. Next week, we're back on campus in the parking lot 
and, and in the courtyard and also online, 9 o'clock and 11. So I encourage you to start to register already. You can register already for next week's services, and hopefully we'll see many of you here. I'm hoping as we start in this new year that more and more people are feeling when it's the right time they can gather together. We're following all the protocols. We're using social distancing, but come and join us, but register first and be part of that. We really, really want to see you here. And so I want to encourage you to, to be part of that. Also, uh, encourage you that this coming Wednesday night, Wednesday, January 6th, plan to join us in the courtyard for Night of Worship. We're going to kick off the new year with Night of Worship, a whole new series entitled What's in a Name? And we're looking at the names of Jesus Christ, the names of the God that we worship. And it's going to be a powerful year of worship. So this Wednesday... Get online, register, or put it on your counter and be at home and watch online. We will live stream from the courtyard to your home. So we'll see you on Wednesday in your home online or right here in the courtyard. If you need prayer for anything, would you just simply utilize the information on the screen and share that need with us and we will respond and pray for you. We promise we'll lift up those prayers and cry out to the Lord on your behalf or those who you love that you share about. And if you're new at Shoreline, maybe you're starting a new year and you thought, I'm going to start going to church and Shoreline's online, I want to give you a personal warm welcome. And all you need to do is to text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen. And we will follow up and try to get to know more about you, whatever you want to share with us and answer questions about the church. But we look forward to getting to know you better as we go forward. Now I want to send you off with a word of blessing. As you go into this new year, will you go profoundly aware that the God of the universe served you by coming in human flesh, he served you by living a perfect life and modeling what a life of faith looks like. He served us and gave us an example by washing the feet of his disciples. He served us by dying on the cross in our place for our sins. And he calls us to live for him. Will you look for opportunities, listen to the voice of the Spirit, and humbly serve others wherever you go. For the glory of God, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.